1954. This season, Minnesota returns 12 starters from last year's team, including five on offense and six on defense. Coach, go ahead with your opening statement. I uh, appreciate everybody being here. It's an honor to be back. Uh, I did want to start uh, just today with our thoughts and prayers going out uh, to the entire Sperano family. Uh, Minnesota is a very tight-knit group. It's a tight state, especially our athletic team spending one year there. You've kind of realized that. And, and uh, Coach Sperano, as you've, any of you have known him or spent time around him, incredible coach, but an incredible person. And, um, you know, Minnesota lost a really phenomenal coach. But the one thing I want to make sure everybody understands is uh, over the course of the last 24 hours, I haven't heard anybody share any stories about a technique or a fundamental or what type of offensive line coach he was. Uh, all we continue to hear is what type of person and the impact he made on so many lives. So I know all of us want to win. We want to win championships. We want to win. We want to win the conference, do all those things. You're here for all that. But at the end of the day, we're teachers, we're educators, and the difference we make and all these coaches make on lives is really important. And for those that knew Tony, I'm sure he made a huge impact on you. So I just wanted to start with that. Just want to thank our president, uh, President Kaler, who's in his final year. I'm sure a lot of you heard that. Uh, Director Coyle uh, and his wife, Kristen, my wife, Heather, uh, for being here today and our, our board of regents, our fans, our alumni, our boosters. And I'm just really proud to represent the University of Minnesota in year two uh, as we continue to move forward. Um, we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of opportunities coming up. Uh, uh, with our university and where we are. But again, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, I think last year, Pat Fitzgerald got up here after me and said, okay, well, um, now he doesn't have any time left since I used it all, I think. And I think every one of you counted how many words I said last year. So uh, we have a very, very youthful, very young, very inexperienced football team, which does not necessarily mean we can't win. We have a very talented football team, just incredibly young. We have nine scholarship players on offense and defense, 14 scholarship players as juniors. Uh, or I mean, nine scholarship seniors uh, on offense and defense, 14 juniors on scholarship offense and defense right around there. Um, and then everybody else is underclassmen. Uh, we're going to rely heavily on our young players uh, to play, make plays, but the one thing about young players is sometimes they don't, know how young, or good, or they don't know how bad they are. They don't know how good they are. You haven't really watched them play. You haven't worked a ton with them. They get in there and, and really surprise you. But uh, we've talked to our team about how inexperienced and young we're going to be. Our whole model for the year is race to maturity. And maturity we define as uh, when doing what you have to do becomes doing what you want to do. And that's when people grow up. So we're going to need our young freshmen, our true freshmen, our redshirt freshmen. That new redshirt rule really helps us a lot. We're going to need those players uh, to grow up really fast. And that's what this whole offseason has been designed about. Uh, we lost three really close games by a matter of a few points. And uh, we just didn't finish games. And uh, I thought that our team last year wanted to win, but we didn't refuse to lose. We didn't have that refuse to lose mentality. And there's a major difference between those two things. And this whole offseason, we focused around being to ha or having that for our players to be able to accomplish that uh, here this offseason and springboard into this year. So very excited about the year, anticipating the year highly, really excited about our uh, one of the greatest recruiting classes in Minnesota history joining us in 2018 right now. And then we're really excited, I think, right now, a top 25 class for 2019 that will join us later. But really, pr really proud of the players we have within our program who have grown up over the course of the last year and a half. So uh, I think with that, we'll open it up with uh, some questions. Coach, we're going to start over here on our left. Andy Greeter, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Hi, Andy. Hey, Coach. Um, just wanted to ask you kind of what you learned in your first year at Minnesota and how can you carry those lessons over to year two? I think the biggest thing you learn as a coach whenever you take over programs and, and, and we haven't done won a championship for so long, whether that was Western Michigan, whether that was the University of Minnesota, I enjoy that. Uh, and I enjoy the first few years that are usually pretty rough um, in different ways. Uh, I call it the, the, the dirty water years, uh, the muddy waters. Uh, those are things at times where people, some people might like that, some people might not. But it goes back to the greatest lesson I learned from Greg Schiano, who still continues to be an influence in my life. Never sacrifice what you really want down the road for what you want right now. We're in a right now society. We need it now. When are you going to do it now? Well, we haven't for 51 years as a championship football team. And the reason why I took the job was to be the bridge and have our staff be the bridge and our culture be the bridge from then till now. Uh, but the biggest thing I've learned is, is simply re reassuring that. Every year you want to make sure you reassure yourself of the things that you know, that you believe in, and I think we've done that. Year one is a lot different than year two, Andy. I mean, year one is all about learning. Everything's new, no matter what. Everything's new. 
Uh, and year two, you start to master that. Not only you have some guys master that, but now they can start teaching other players. So your players start to lead a lot more than just the coaches. But last year, we were not a player-led football team. Uh, bad teams, nobody leads. Average teams, coaches lead. Elite teams, players lead. You've heard me say that before, and we weren't at that level. We've got to build that as we continue to go. So that's why we're going to rely heavily on those seniors. Not a lot of them, but they have to do a tremendous job of bringing those young guys along. Coach, we'll move down here to the very front row for our next question. Ryan Schuling, Great Lakes Divide. PJ, when I spoke to you year two at Western Michigan, you had gone through a tremendous transition, a purge, if you will, of a lot of players to try to get your guys in. As you evaluate this process, kind of building on what you just answered, where are you in that process? What are the steps in that process? How do you define it? And what is the ultimate goal where you'll feel like we've arrived, this is Minnesota, and this is the way I want things? Yeah, one thing I, I think I, I one thing I've learned about Minnesota is they want honesty exactly where's our program. Uh, just because we're a young and inexperienced team doesn't mean we can't win ahead of schedule. Uh, I said the same thing at Western Michigan. I think we started one and three, and then we went on a seven-game winning streak and shocked everybody, including myself. And... Um, I think right now, I call it year one. I know everybody sits there and says, what is he talking about? Year one last year is really year zero, the way I look at a program. And I know everybody's like, what do you mean by that? Is that just to get a contract extension? Is that just to, to delay a process? No, that's reality. Year zero, everybody's learning. Everybody's getting to know each other. Uh, we took over a very tumultuous time, uh, to be honest with you. And so we had a lot of things to, to, to have happen. We had players leave, players stay. But it was a, it was a transitional time. When you get to year one right now, I mean, if you look at our team, I think we're 128 out of 130 in terms of youth and inexperience. We have two quarterbacks who have never played who are both freshmen. And we have Ty Johnson, yes, but other than that, I think everyone else Ty is going to play with is going to be a redshirt freshman or a true freshman. Uh, we have true freshman, redshirt freshman, offensive lineman. Our defensive backfield is going to be filled with young, inexperienced players, our D-line, linebackers. So when you look at our two deep, that's where we are. Uh, I think that there's a process to that happening, but one thing about young teams, and when you're in year two, you can't have yourself not be surprised, but you're kind of surprised by it all as it continues to take shape. Uh, there's not like, hey, by year three, this is going to happen. Year four, this happens. It all takes its own time. Being young and inexperienced and playing freshman in the Big Ten, I think is a little different than it was in the Mid-American Conference. There's a size. There's a strength component. There's, uh, you're playing you know, top 15 teams in the country at times, year, week in, week out. So there's a strength component to that when you're young that maybe you can get away with the league I was in before, but you can't get away with that in the Big Ten. So we're in year one the way I look at it, uh, and we're here to develop our quarterbacks because it all starts with them and continue to bring this program along by joining the 19s next year but uh, obviously our focus is right now of developing academically athletically socially and spiritually in everything we do coach we'll go all the way to the back of the room on the left Connor O'Gara Saturday tradition coach you've seen uh, the playoff perspective from Western Michigan you've seen it now in the Big Ten Conference what's your overall impression of the, uh, the just the effectiveness of it Oh, I think it's the best thing to happen to college football. I, th I think it's brilliant. Uh, there's nothing more exciting than finding out who's going to be in the college football playoff. Um, I think one of the challenges are when you're starting to schedule and if people are scheduling, one of the issues they're having is what is the college football committee really truly valuing? Um, you saw everything with strength of schedule maybe at the beginning, and now is it an undefeated season? It depends who's on the committee. What are their thoughts? What are their ideas? And as you're making more plans to schedule games, you look at all those things as a head football coach, uh, whether that's the Big Ten or the SEC. But I think we have all the systems in place. I think the NCAA is making a lot of elite decisions, especially with the new redshirt rule. So um, I think we're really in a really good place in college football. The game's safer than it's ever been. Uh, the college football playoff has brought a completely new dynamic. Uh, I was asked a question today, do you still feel like a group of five teams should be able to do that if you go undefeated now that you're not in the group of five? And I said, absolutely. I'm a huge advocate of that. And I'm sure Scott Frost might say the same thing. Um, but I think the ability for that to happen might not happen for a while. Um, and I think the possibility of that ever happening is there. Maybe if you go 13-0 and and 13-0. and But they say that one last year doesn't affect necessarily this year. But I think that could start to to turn the tide a little bit if you have a team that's 26 and 0. I mean, you force somebody to do something. Um, but again, I, I love where it's at. It's a very exciting time in our game. Coach, we'll move over to our right side of the room, right smack in the middle here. 
Hey, Coach. Uh, Blake Rain, Daily Gopher. Uh, you mentioned youth and experience specifically at the quarterback and the wide receiver positions. Can you talk about what your expectations are this season for the passing game and what you've seen from those two positions this offseason? Yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the most cliche coach when it comes to expectations, and I've said this my six years of being head coach. We're going to be better today than we were yesterday academically, athletically, socially, and spiritually. That is the, that is the expectation. Uh, it's a peace of mind. Because sooner or later, 10 wins won't be good enough. Nine wins aren't good enough. Coaches get fired all the time for that number. So what is that magic number? If you're at some places, it's national championship or, or you're out. So it's what is that expectation? Our expectation is making sure our players, our student athletes, are better on the field, off the field, every single day, are becoming a team, doing the right things, creating a culture that can advance their life in every avenue of their life, and eventually you'll get the wins on the field. Um, but in terms of people ask me about the system and what are we changing, same coordinator, Kirk Sharaka, year one at Western Michigan, one and 11 worst offense in America. Two years later, three years later, the top 20 offenses back to back, then a Cotton Bowl appearance. Uh, same coach, same guys, same system. We change it based on what can our players do? What can they manage? What are their strengths? We adapt our offense that way, but it's the same thing. It comes down to, it will, it comes down to how well our quarterback can play. And I'm really excited to see out of the two guys who can win the team. You know, we have two quarterbacks. I mean, that's not exactly a position every coach wants to be in, but we have other needs. I mean, I would love to take four quarterbacks. I'd love to take, you know, we had to take seven offensive linemen this year. A lot of people don't do that. We had to, right? And a lot of those guys are going to see the field. So we had a lot of depth holes to fill very quickly, and we've got to continue to do that in 19 as well. Time for one or two more questions. And we will start right back on our left toward the back. Matt Charbon of Detroit News. Uh, Coach, I'm just curious, your position with the Supreme Court ruling on legalizing gambling you know, or states being allowed to, uh, there's talk of a uh, more of a national approach to injury reports and being more open about injuries. Is that something that you would like to see happen? I know the commissioner said he would like to see that happen on a national basis. Uh, is that two questions? Are you talking the gambling first and then the... Well, just more, just more about the injury reports, if, if that's something you're open to being... I think it's uh, true. I, yeah. I, I'm all for it. Uh, now, the specific reason why somebody's not playing, I, I don't agree with. I think there's a lot of things in our university and our policies that we have to protect with the student athletes' rights. Um, but I would love to be able to. I'll give the information just like somebody else. But I, just like the NFL, now they give specific things. But if is somebody going to be available or not available? That's all I want to know. I don't even know why whether it's a suspension, whether it's an injury, whether it's a knee, whether it's grades, whether it's discipline. I don't need to know all that. But I'm a huge advocate. I would love to be able to see who's going to be able to play and not play. I think that, it, that creates different game planning. It gives you a better advantage, but you're also giving somebody an advantage, so it's an equal playing field. Uh, but I think, it, I think teams have the right to know that. Time for one more question. 